see all of you here. I'm glad you didn't win. First time I recall, first time I recall seeing one of these, I was watching somebody on video, and I kept thinking, "What is that thing in front of his mouth?" <laughs> so, that's what it is. Uh, open to Romans, chapter five, <clears throat> and I should say, as we begin, um, my wife got sick a week and a half ago, and. Uh, so, I'm I'm feeling good, but I'm still having sometimes some throat issues and so forth. So, I'm going to do the best I can. Um, I have some water with me. Sorry. Oh, I don't know. I don't think I have anything to do with that, as far as. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Romans chapter 5. And when I saw I I assumed that whoever uh, verse 8 in mind is but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. So let's uh, let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll look in here in Romans chapter 5. Jean, can you just pull a chair up here? And I have my water a little handier. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for the privilege that it is for us to gather together this weekend to rejoice in all that we have in Christ and uh, especially to rejoice in God's love uh, toward us and also learn about how we can demonstrate that love to, uh, with others. We thank you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 5 again, and I want to begin reading in verse 1. So verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just a little... Uh, in this chapter... One, Paul is looking at the first 2,000 years of human history, from, from the time Adam sinned until the time of the It's about 2,000 years. And his main point in Romans chapter 1 is that the Gentiles are under sin. Okay, then in Romans chapter 2, he's looking at history from Abraham to Paul is about 2,000 years. So that's the time during which Israel, when they were given the law, and Romans chapter 2, Paul explains that they broke the law. And so the main point in chapter 2 is that the Jews are under sin. Then when you come to chapter 3, he begins a chapter by answering some objections that the Jews would have after reading chapter 2. And then if you look at chapter 3 and verse 9, he says, what then? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So that kind of summarizes what he has taught so far in Romans. He has proven in chapter 1 that the Gentiles are under sin. He has proven in chapter 2 that the Jews are under sin. And now he again states this conclusion in chapter 3, verse 9. And then he goes on, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And uh, so he, he begins by showing the problem that all men have, Jews and Gentiles, and that there's no solution in and of in ourselves, there's no solution to the problem because there's none righteous, no, not one. And then he gets into how, how God solved that problem. Um, in chapter 3, verse 28, he says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And then chapter 4, he gives two examples of men who were justified by faith, Abraham and David. And he goes into some detail on that. Then you come to chapter 1, verse 1. And he says, therefore, being justified by faith. So uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 is, I believe, 
once a person is saved, once a person, and I'll comment on that later, um, but once a person is justified, what is the first thing that they should be taught? And in most churches, the first thing that you're going to be taught, if you, you know, whatever terminology they use, you become a Christian, get saved, whatever they say, the first thing they will do is they will teach you okay, now that you're a Christian, you have to do this, do this, do this, stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. That's the first thing, even in many so-called grace churches. But with the word of God, what's the first thing? Once you're justified by faith, what's the first thing? Again, chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have. So that's the first thing that all believers ought to know and need to know is not what I have to do and what I have to stop doing, but rather what we have in Christ. So continuing in verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now notice, the, uh, just notice the expression in verse 5 about the love of God, because of course that's what we're talking about here this weekend. Um, but I want to pick it up and uh, look a little more carefully, beginning in verse 6. So verse 6, he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So before we were justified by faith, and this is true of every one of us, we were, as it says, without strength. We, we were weak, we were helpless. We were completely incapable of resisting sin. Uh, we could choose this sin instead of that sin, but in, in either case, we're going to sin. Uh, we, we were unable to save ourselves. Turn, uh, we're going to come right back here, but turn to Proverbs chapter 5. Sin... Sin binds us, holds us in bondage, and, and we were without strength being held under sin. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 22 says, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. And that's really where all of us were before we were justified by faith is, as it says, we were holden with the cords of his sins. And then also turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Gospel of John, chapter 8, and verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And of course, we all committed sin. And so again, we were servants of sin, held in bondage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, back again in Romans chapter 5, we were without strength. You'll have to pardon me, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of that. <coughs> uh, look in Romans chapter 2 for a moment. Again, when, when we were without strength, we, we could try to be good, as many do. They try to be good, they try to be religious, but the problem is, again, we were without strength. And what happened as we were trying to be good, trying to be better, trying to be more religious, what happened? Romans chapter 2 and beginning in verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself 
wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. <clears throat> All that time when we were trying to be good and, and trying to be more religious, we didn't know that actually what we were doing was treasuring up wrath. We were without strength. Okay, back in Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> also, if you notice in verse 6, it says that Christ died for the ungodly. So we were without strength. We were also ungodly. That means we, we were without God. We, we were not in line with God in our thoughts, in our speech, in our conduct. We were ungodly. Um, Paul calls also another term he uses is children of disobedience, not, not glorifying God. And so the wonderful news here in Romans chapter 5 is that God justifies the ungodly. Um, look back for a moment, Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. This is one of my favorite Bible verses. There are lots of others too, but this is one of them. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. But to him that worketh not, and I, I love the way that verse begins, because mo many people, of course, teach that you have to do works to get saved of one sort or another, or stop doing some things to get saved. But there also are a number of churches that will teach that, that salvation is by faith, and they'll emphasize the importance of faith but then, when pressed a bit, they will start adding works into the picture. Um, there's recently a very famous evangelist who died, and uh, some people lauded him and praised him and so forth. Um, a few people criticized him, and in many cases took a lot of heat for daring to do so. But, you know, the thing with him and and countless others. Um, when I was a kid, I used to sometimes watch him on television because he was on quite often. And I realized that one night you could watch him and you could get a very clear gospel. And if you believed what he said, you could get saved. But the next night you watch him and it's a, it's a different message. And the third night, a different message. And so there's, you know, ask Jesus to come into your heart, make him the Lord of your life, walk forward, all of these different messages. And many of them, when, when you really come to the essence of it, are works messages. And so chapter 4 and verse 5 again, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I, everywhere that I preach in India, uh, this is one of the verses I always use. And I, and I ask them some questions. And one of the questions I ask is, <clears throat> I ask them to look at chapter 4 and verse 5, and then tell me, who does God justify? And I often, it takes a long time often to get the correct answer. Now many of them will say, he justifies those who believe. And that's true. But, uh, you know, and I, I say that's true. We've already talked about that. But look at the verse again and tell me, whom does God justify? And again, it takes, I have to really yank it out of them because, and my contention, uh, once, once the correct answer comes out, I tell them the reason it took so long to get the correct answer to something that's very simple in the verse is that most Christians don't believe it. He says again in verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth who? The ungodly. And most Christians, and, and I, I will tell you this is true in, in many grace churches too, true, too, if you have, uh, just say for example, that Greg goes to church every Sunday, he's a very honest, kind person, helps many people, it doesn't drink and smoke and all that bad stuff. So he appears to be a very godly man. And then let's imagine 
I never go to church. I'm a thief and a drunkard and a jerk. So I appear to be a very ungodly person. Who has a better chance to go to heaven? And I will tell you, not only in Christendom out there, but even in many grace churches, of course, now, if I ask you that question now, you all, if you've been listening or paying attention, you know the correct answer. But I will tell you that many, even in grace churches, they have this ideal, he's surely going to go to heaven. If you look at him, he's got to be a Christian. <laughs> yeah? Somebody who, who looks like that, acts like that, he, surely he's going to go to heaven. And then they look at me and they see uh, I'm drinking and I never go to church and this and that. I think I'm, I'm a hopeless cause. But the good news in that verse is that God justifies the ungodly. And that's wonderful news for you and me because we are ungodly. Um, if you remember, Jesus told uh, a story about how two men came to the temple and one of them walks right up boldly and he begins to pray, oh God, I thank you that I am not like other men and begins to try to impress God with how much better he is than other men. The other stands far back and he just says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And which one went home justified? Not the one who thought that he was righteous, but the one who knew that he was ungodly. Okay, uh, return to chapter 5 in Romans. And so in verse 6, Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> and it's also significant to notice that he, he didn't wait until we start going to church or we stop doing this or we start doing this and then die for us. But he, because that's again, many have that idea. Yeah, you just got to clean your life up a bit and then, then you can get saved. But he died for the ungodly. Um, turn to Galatians chapter 3 and uh, we're going to keep coming back to Romans the whole time. But Galatians chapter 3. Also, I mentioned as you're turning to Galatians that the verse in Romans says Christ died for the ungodly. It doesn't say he died for some of the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. He died for all of them. Okay, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That, that again is a, an amazing verse in the Bible. That he, in verse 13, he was made a curse for us. When you think of what we know about Jesus Christ, who he was, and then think because of you, because of me, he was made a curse. Can you imagine <laughs> what, what he had to undergo because of you, because of me? And he died for the ungodly. He took our penalty. Um, if you go back again to Romans, and <coughs> we, uh, we read, and I just briefly pointed out, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So how is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts? Well, I believe, you know, who, who, who was it that inspired the word of God? It's the Holy Ghost. And so how is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts? Through the word of God. So right away, the next verse in verse 6, as we've been seeing, we, we, learn, we learn something about the love of God, that he died for the ungodly. He died for us when we were without strength. So there's our evidence of God's love. Uh, look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. <clears throat> 
also chapter 8. Chapter 8, by the way, is one of the most wonderful chapters in the Bible uh, concerning the love of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Again, imagine that God the Father delivered his beloved son for us. He spared not what, what he loved the most, his own son. He spared not. Um, and then turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When we were without strength, when we were ungodly, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul here is talking about the cross and, and the, the gospel, and he talks about it as the, the weakness of God. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Because that's how the world views the cross. That's how they view Christ dying on the cross is it's the weakness of God. Of course, we were the ones that were weak, and yet the weakness of God gave us the salvation. Okay, back to Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Notice in verse 6 it says that in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So there was a certain time in which God planned that his son would die for the ungodly. Uh, go back to Galatians again, or, or go there. Galatians chapter 4. And verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman made under the law. So in, in due time, when the fullness of time was come. And then again, back to Romans chapter 5. And you can uh, actually go back in the Old Testament even, for example, Daniel chapter 9, and you can see God had a timetable all laid out, and there was a certain time when his son would die. And so that's the due time. Okay, Romans chapter 5 and verse 7. <clears throat> for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. So in verse 7, Paul is going to use an illustration from, from human experience. And, uh, and he's going to do that to emphasize how, how amazing and how wonderful it is that Christ would die for the ungodly. So he's going to compare in verse 7 dying for a righteous man or dying for a good man or doing what Christ did for us. So those, those are the three things that he's going to compare here. So first of all, in verse 7, Paul writes about <clears throat> dying for a righteous man. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Now he's not talking here about about a man who's righteous in the sight of God. He's not talking about a man who's justified by faith. He's talking about someone who appears to be a righteous man in the sight of other men. Uh, and so his point he, is that it would, be, it would be rare that someone would be willing to die for a righteous man. Now, the, the righteous man in verse 7, the idea is it's someone who, who follows the law and is careful not to break the law, is careful to do what, what appears to be good. Um, you know, kind of a, a do-gooder or goody two-shoes, we used to use that term when I was younger. Um, that's kind of the idea of what he's talking about. So he, he does what is required to stay out of trouble with the law. Uh, and he does what he thinks he needs to do to, to look good in the sight of others. So that's the idea of the righteous man. 
He, he's careful to follow all the rules so nobody can accuse him of doing something wrong. But key in this is that although he, he's careful to try to give this appearance of being upright, being righteous, he's not a compassionate, affectionate, generous person. The, the righteous man in verse 7. So he's a, he's a kind of person that people respect because again, they, see, they can't really accuse him of breaking the law or you know, committing crime, anything like that. And they see him doing good things. And so they respect him, but they don't feel affection for him. Because again, he himself is not a compassionate, warm, loving sort of a person. In fact, they may even kind of resent him. And so that's why I talked about, you know, the, the do-gooder or the goody two-shoes or whatever term you want to use. Uh, a lot of times those kind of people are kind of resented because they always have to give the appearance of they're always doing the right thing and, you know, so on and so forth. And so, so Paul's point in verse 7 is that he, he says, scarcely would someone die for the righteous man. So it's possible that you would die for such a man, but it's, it's unlikely. Uh, so scarcely means possible, but unlikely that you would die for a righteous man. Okay, then he goes on in verse seven, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. So now Paul's gonna give the example of a good man. And now again, he's talking about someone who in the sight of men appears to be a good person. Um, he's not talking about someone who's good in the sight of God. If you look back in chapter three, uh, and I already read verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So in the sight of God, God says there's none righteous, there's none that doeth good. So in Romans chapter five and verse seven, just like with the righteous man, um, it's not talking about how God views that person, but it's talking about that men view that person, in this case, as being a good man. And so he's talking here about someone again, who appears to be good in the, in the sight of men. But he, it's clear in verse 7 that it's more likely that someone would die for a good man rather than for a righteous man. Now, now why would that be? Well, because the good man is kind and generous and affectionate. And so you, like I said, with a righteous man... You may respect him, but you probably don't have a lot of affection and affectionate feelings toward him. You might even resent him. A good man is someone that you would have warm affection for because, again, he's a kind, generous, compassionate person. Uh, it does much to help to benefit other people. And so uh, and th there are many, many righteous men, but good men are rare. And again, talking about in, in, with, in human eyes. And so with a, case, with a good man, people not only respect him again, but they feel an affection toward him. And so he says in verse seven, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. So perhaps, maybe, you know, unlikely you'd die for a righteous man, perhaps you would for a good man. So that's the point in verse seven. Okay, then verse eight, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were righteous, Christ died for our sins. While we were good, no. no. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so he, he's making this comparison. In contrast to verse 7, God did not die for righteous men. He did not die for good men but he died for sinners. He died for the ungodly. So 
man's love, you know, verse 7 is talking about man's love at its greatest. At, it, at its greatest, man would die for a righteous man. At the next greatest, man would die for a good man. But that's the height of a, a man's love. But in verse 8, God died for us in that while we were yet sinners. Now it says, God commendeth his love toward us. Um, the word commendeth, you know, a lot of people um, are eager to go to the Greek and the Hebrew and, uh, and, and try to correct the King James Bible. And I, you know, what I noticed many years ago when I hear people doing that is nine times out of ten, they don't understand English. <laughs> I, I tell you, I could give so many examples where somebody stands up and say, says, you know, in the Greek, you know, this should be this or it would be better to be this and so on and so forth. And then they explain why they say that. And I think they don't understand English. So, you know, that's the first thing is you should understand English. And even words that we think that we understand, um, I found a good English dictionary can, can be helpful. So let me tell you what an English dictionary says about the word commendeth in verse 8. Commendeth means to represent as worthy of notice. So there's something and you know, like you're holding it out and saying, here is something that's worthy of notice. It means to recommend to praise, to present to favorable notice. So when it says in verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, God is, is pointing out his love toward us as, as being worthy of notice. And what specifically is it that we should take note of that Christ died for us? And I also want to point out that when Christ died for us, <coughs> all of our sins were future. Uh, the, there's this strange idea in many churches that th there are many churches that will teach that we're justified by faith through grace. But then after you become a Christian, then you have to do all this stuff and stop doing all this stuff or else God's going to punish you in some way or, or hold back his blessing in some way. And really what you end up with in many churches is that God is more gracious toward the unsaved than he is toward the saved. Because the unsaved, all you have to do is believe and God will give you eternal life. But as a saved person, if you want God's blessing, you got to do all this stuff and stop doing all this stuff to get his blessing. But that's not the case. When Christ died for our sins, all of our sins were future and he died for all of them. And Christ, Christ's death on the cross is the exhibit of God's love. That's why God is commending that. He's, he's holding that out, pointing that out for us, that it's worthy of notice. He, God, uh, I mentioned one of the def definitions of command is to recommend. God is recommending to us that we look at the cross of Christ because it conclusively and eternally proves God's love for us. Uh, going back earlier in the context of Romans, as we talked about briefly, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Well, Christ, he didn't die only for the Jews. He didn't die only for the Gentiles, not only for the rich, not for the poor, but he died for all. He died for the ungodly. He died for us because we were sinners. So God's love is forever established on the cross. Uh, many, many people, even many believers, are constantly doubting God's love for them. Again, even in many grace churches, you find people, if they, if they get sick, if they suffer some financial hardship or having some kind of a problem, they start thinking, you know, God, why are you doing this to me? And, you know, what, what, what did I do to upset you that you would do this to me? And what, where is your love? I don't feel your love. I'm not seeing your love in my life and so forth. So I tell you, I have to bite my tongue. <laughs> uh, how irritating that is to me 
when I hear Christians talking like that. You mean Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying on the cross for you is not enough to convince you that God loves you? You have to have God help you get over your headache or find a parking spot or make the weather more pleasant to your liking. God, that's what God has to do to convince you that he loves you. The, the cross of Christ, his son dying, is not enough to convince you of that. This is the thing that God, this is how God commends his love toward us. He doesn't commend his love toward us by saying, I'm going to do this thing for you, and I'm going to do that thing for you, and I'm, I'm going to take away your trouble, and I'm going to make life more pleasant for you, and I'm going to do what you, what you want me to do. This is how God commends his love toward us, that Christ died for us. Uh, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. John chapter 15. And this is a, a very, one of the most famous verses in Christendom. John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And, and again, I, I couldn't count the number of times I've heard that verse read and preached on and, and so forth. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But almost every time I hear people read that verse or talk about that verse, they fail to point out there's a greater love than that. There's a greater love than laying down your life for your friends. And that's what we are reading about in Romans chapter 5, that Christ died. Go back, keep John open, we're going to come right back, but go back again to Romans chapter 5. In, in verse 6, Christ died for those who were without strength. He died for the ungodly. In verse 8, he died for sinners. <clears throat> and verse, uh, verse 10, for if when we were enemies, he died for us when we were enemies. So John, you can go back to John 15. John 15, 13 is often presented as the greatest love that there could ever be in all of the universe, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. That's not the greatest love. The greatest love is what we're reading about in Romans chapter 5, where you would lay down your life, not for your friends, but for your enemies, for those who hate you, for those who oppose you in every way possible. That's what Christ did. Um, if you look in John 15, the next verse, verse 14 says, Ye my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Are you his friend? Based on verse 14? Am I? No, we're not. I mean, thank God that we're not under John 15, 13. Because we'd be in big trouble if we were under that. But we're under, and, and you know, John 15 is talking about a different thing, um, but it, it's often lifted out of context. So we are under Romans chapter 5, that he died for the ungodly. He died for us when we were his enemies. So that's, uh, you know, when I looked at the schedule and I saw the topic that I was given, I thought, yeah, I think I could, I'd be willing to talk on that topic. Uh, you know, there could hardly be a more wonderful topic to talk about than to talk about God's love toward us. And again, I want to emphasize that God commends his love toward us in that Christ died for us. Never, ever for a moment should any one of us, whatever the circumstances of our lives, question or doubt God's love for us. It's conclusively, eternally proven on the cross. Father, we thank you for, uh, again, the opportunity for us to gather together this weekend. And uh, I pray that we would, not only this weekend, but each and every day for the rest of our lives, uh, rejoice in and focus on the love of God demonstrated in the cross of Christ. And that we would keep in mind that that's what you commend toward us. And I pray that as we go through the rest of this weekend that
Uh, we again would appreciate that more and more and also learn how the love of God ought to affect, uh, affect us in all areas of our lives. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.